If you're enjoying Cowboy Crossroads and would like to help me continue this work to chronicle cowboy culture, there are a few things you could do. If you haven't already, you could leave a review in the iTunes store. I'm told that this helps more people discover the show. You could also make a one-time donation on my website at andyhedges.com. Or you could consider becoming a patron of the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is an online platform that allows you to offer monthly support to creative projects that you enjoy. And in exchange for that support, you get access to some exclusive content. In my case, you get access to some unreleased episodes of the podcast. You can check that out online at patreon.com slash cowboy crossroads. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash cowboy crossroads. I'd like to start today's show with a piece of poetry written by my friend Joel Nelson of Alpine, Texas. This poem reminded me of today's guest and Joel Nelson was kind enough to share it with me so that I could share it with you. Some men are born to write, although they'll never pen a word. Some men are born to cowboy, yet they'll never work a herd. Cut out to be professors, some might never teach in school. And some who should be builders may not ever lift a tool. Yet, something draws the others, ere their life has slipped away, and the world receives a Rembrandt, Van Gogh, or Hemingway. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working cowboy west and beyond. My guest today is Dr. Charles Bud Townsend. Dr. Townsend was born in 1929 and has spent his life as a rodeo announcer, boot salesman, history professor, and writer. If you haven't already, I'd recommend going back to the previous episode of the podcast and listening to the first part of my interview with Dr. Townsend, where he talks about his family history, how he got into rodeo, and how he came to write the biography of Bob Wills. In talking about his life in rodeo and academia, Dr. Townsend once said this, I owe a debt to rodeo that I can never repay. Rodeo taught me how to teach students so they enjoyed learning. Here's Dr. Charles Bud Townsend. A lot of professors never get to speak to the people outside the classroom what I'd call the common people. Well, when I'd, I would uh, lecture, meet my classes, nine months out of the year. Then I would go out rodeoing. Well, when you announce a rodeo and you've got children there from three years old up to their grandparents who are 70, 80, 90, you better use straightforward English. Oh, I'd drop a few big words once in a while to my own detriment, but I tried to be, to talk to people just like I'm talking to you. And I think it kept me with a uh, common touch. I think I always had it. I would say this, that my teaching career got better the more I 
I learned what I just told you. Of course, if you go to one of those great schools like Wisconsin, I studied under Mer Merrill Jensen. He's the one that Oxford University chose to write all of the documents from the American side of the American Revolution. He was a great teacher. Merle Curty, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and they even knighted him. He was my major professor. They knighted him in Sweden for his American studies. Harvard, summa cum laude, and one can go on and on. Well, when I first came back to teach, at, I taught two years at Hardin Simmons. I wanted to be little Merle Curdy, little Merrill Jensen. And when I taught a year at Tech, same way. I, I was bound to have been very straight, cold. And then when I first came here, I uh, wanted to be like Curty, and he was a great teacher, or, or, or Jensen. He was a better teacher, but uh, not as famous. See, one of them was an American Revolution man. The other was, he wrote the book on intellectual history, the history of ideas. Well, when I came back to WT, I wouldn't let them tape my lectures, or I wish I had of, because I think I'd really laugh, I'd hear them now, because I, I was so straight and wore the bow tie, you know, looked like a professor. When I really became a, a good professor, I would say a great teacher, but that sounds a bit immodest. And when I first came here at what was then at West Texas State University. I was still trying to be someone else. But then I began to let my hair down. I began to go back to the days of Bing Crosby and Bob Wills and even taught history through music. When I really became a good teacher, and I think... That goes without saying. I show you the awards upstairs. Was when I became Bud Townsend. When I became myself, I had fun, whatever. I've learned one thing in in life, and this is true in show business. That's in rodeo, and I sure learned it in academia. As long as you're trying to copy someone else, you'll never be at your best. Every teacher, every man, wherever, a woman, has something in them that if they can let it loose, then they'll be a lot better. So as time went on, I forgot the bow tie and wore Levi's and became Bud Townsend and had fun, still a, still a good teacher, a tough teacher. You're not going to be a good teacher if you're not a tough teacher. It can't be all fun. The reason they took my class, it was fun. I was a great lecturer. That was really my forte, great lecture. And then I gave a test a week. That drove a lot of them off. They didn't like, they didn't like that. But that's kind of what happened to me in, in academia. When I became myself, had fun, like I was at a rodeo or wherever, then was when I became a much better teacher. Does that answer your question? I kept that common touch from rodeo. And, you know, that worked the other way. I think I was a better rodeo announcer because I taught and knew certain ways to approach language. Of course, my lectures, I knew them so well 
they were really just show business. I never used to, they'd want to put me in the who's who in the South or who's who in the Southwest. They're, if they asked you a question, they said, what is your profession? You know what I put down? Performing artist. <laughs> because that's all I really ever was. I had learned in show business how to put things over, and I learned how to do it in class. Every lecture I got, when I really got good, it was just a performance. Oh, there's a, there's a picture I'm dressed up like Teddy Roosevelt there. I would dress like him, but lecture that the students liked the best that I did was Ferdinand and Isabella, Columbus. And I really had a, it burns me down today for these little nobodies who who want to tear down Columbus's statue or whatever, and he turned the world upside down. It's easy for people who've never accomplished anything to knock a man like Columbus, you know, or George Washington. And I loved my subjects, uh, whether I was lecturing on Cortez, the conquistador, or whether I was lecturing on Columbus or Theodore Roosevelt. And, uh, and I had certain boots that I wore for the Theodore Roosevelt and the spurs like they wore, you know, that just had the little nub on them. I tell you, that's why I missed teaching so much when I retired. I love to teach. I loved every lecture. And I think it, it, it rubbed off on the students. They know whether you love what you're doing. And they'd come in there every day and some of them say, wonder what he's got to do today, you know. I never had a job except one. I washed dishes in a cafe. That was for nine dollars for forty-eight hours of work. Nine dollars a week. In those days they didn't have dishwashers, and people put their old cigarettes, and it was a nasty job. But I enjoyed every job I ever had. I just love shining shoes. Because I got to meet people like you two and shine their shoes and talk to them and, and whatever. And uh, I love teaching more, some things more than others. But I, I loved uh, teaching. I love shining shoes. I loved whatever I did, except that one. She, uh, washing those dishes. But I knew early on that I had to work because my mother, she bought, uh, rented an old hotel in Nocona and we lived in that. She worked every job she could. She ran one hotel and made beds in the bigger hotel. I knew I, I needed to work and had to, and liked to work. I don't understand these people today that the government giving them money that don't want to work. To me, work was honorable, whatever it was. So I think, I think if you got a job and you don't like it, get one you do. You'll do better. And i tell you a little story. Of course, the University of Wisconsin is up, up, it's among the best the greatest. Every member of that department was a prima donna. William Heseltine, who trained uh, some of these great historians, he was there when I was there. So I'd studied at Midwestern University. When I got ready to go to Wisconsin, I never told anybody this story. This one teacher she taught me political science, one of the smartest women I ever saw. Quick mind. 
she'd snap her fingers and down some, like she'd scare me to death. And uh, Dr. Neighbors, he, he taught me a lot at Midwestern. And so Dr. Hunt, she was the first woman to ever get a Ph.D. in political science at the University of Texas. Boy, she didn't back off from anybody. She said, now, bud, she may have called me Charles, she, and she was a good friend of my wife. So she said, bud, never will forget it. When you get up there to Wisconsin, and they all had great respect for that place, don't you let them know that you announced rodeos. They might not let you get a Ph.D., PhDs, in a way, are honorary degrees. They give them to whom they want to or to whom they wish. I, I didn't think anything about it. And she didn't much like for me to take off because I had to. I had a family to go to rodeos once in a while. So I got up to Wisconsin, and there were some boys or two that knew me at Baylor, so they knew my background. But I didn't say anything about it. I went there to study history with the best. Forget rodeo. I was still, I still went out in the summers, every summer, while I was there, three years. So word got out that I was a rodeo announcer. And I never put on a cowboy hat or a... I just like anybody else. So one time in the, the hall, word got out. You know, the boys discussed it, and one professor would tell another. And I was walking down the hall one day, and a professor I didn't even know, he said, we called everybody Mr. There was no doctors, Mr. He said, Mr. Townsend, can I ask you a question? Well, now here's this guy. Way up north, no telling where he was educated. He said, can you tell me how you could announce a rodeo? He thought I was something that I could announce a rodeo. Well, then time went on and Mary got sick and I needed a teach, teaching assistant job. So there was a professor named Vernon Carstensen. He and Merrill Curdy wrote the history of the University of Wisconsin over there. And he'd, he'd come there from the University of Washington, which is a very good school. So I went in to see Mr. Jensen, told him, I said, I, I really need a TA. It didn't pay $250, $300, but nevertheless, Mary had been sick and whatever, and I didn't want to drop out. <clears throat> and so I... Uh, Told Mr. Jensen he was he tried to be hard boiled. He he wanted to have a hard crust on him, so that students wouldn't take advantage of him. I said, Mr. Jensen, I sure needed tea. Oh, he said, Townsend, I'd had his class, made a B in one, an A in the other. He said, We've got so many more, and we can even handle now. So I walked out. You know, I don't mean I walked out on him, but I thanked him. Well, it wasn't but about three days till I got a call from Mr. Carstensen. He said, Townsend, I hear you need a teaching job. I said, yes, I do, Mr. Carstensen. He said, well, you can be one of mine. I've got, I'm going to have three out of class with 500 in it. Now, you think I'm st- straying away from rodeo. So we we would grade the papers of the undergraduates, the, the Ph.D. candidates and all. He handled that. So there was three of us. He came to us about midway through that semester. It's three of us. One boy's name was Blumenthal, and then there was I and somebody else. He said, uh, boys, I need to talk to you. He said, I expect my teaching assistants to lecture one class. 
So he said, you boys get ready. I want each one of you to let 500 people in that class, and you were lectured from a stage. Now, can you imagine those kids that came from New York, Massachusetts, out of the country, had one girl from Ceylon and wherever, you know. Here you had to get up, and I was just a second-year Ph.D. student. I, I was scared to death, those students. L.A. knew so much more than I did, but I knew <laughs> I was going to have to do it. Well, I worried about it, and I went in to Mr. Carstensen. I said, Mr. Carstensen, I don't know what I'll lecture on. Why, well, he said, you're going to lecture on rodeo, of course. That's what they want to hear. Well, I knew I could do that. <laughs> so I got up on that stage and, and gave this lecture on the history of rodeo, and those Yankee kids and all just went wild. They loved it. So it wasn't but a few days later. He said, you sure did a good job. Now, he said, Charlie, he called me Charlie. He said, Charlie, you need to write a history of rodeo. See, here was this teacher in Texas wanted me to be ashamed of rodeo, and here was a great professor that says you need to write a history on rodeo. Uh, so I said, well, maybe I will. I'm working on Samuel Adams. Well, two or three others, that professors and whatever, I think what had happened, they never had had a, a man from show business or whatever to come and study, and they were flattered. How many schools did I pass up in the 1,100 miles to Madison, Wisconsin? I think they really were thrilled with it. And so uh, I told you about going over to Mr. Curdy's when we're getting ready to take prelims. And I said, Mr. Curdy, I know I've told you this. Mr. Curdy, I, I, I just don't think I can. And I bet you, Merrill Curdy, he, he didn't really know what a rodeo was raised over uh, in the Midwest and studied, went to Harvard and all these places. He didn't know what a rodeo was, hardly knew what a horse was. And I said, I don't believe I... He said, Charles, of course you'll pass. Any man who can announce a rodeo can do anything. <laughs> well, that's not the end of the story. I left there and got the PhD and we had a history meeting, Western history, and Carstensen was the president of uh, the Western Historical Society. And I ran into him. I, 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 I was doing a speech on Bob Wills and San Antonio Rose, the song. He was there. And he, saw, he said, Charlie, have you ever written that history of rodeo? <laughs> It had been all these years. I said, no. The day that the meeting was over, I saw him on the elevator. And he said, Charlie, be sure you write that history of rodeo. I've told you all this to say that the woman that kind of looked down on rodeo in Texas, they didn't at this great institution. Isn't that a story? That's awesome. They thought I was something that I could. In fact, I think I might not have gotten a degree without it. I think that really helped me. But anyway, I wanted to get this on tape or whatever for you, and that's what happened. Rodeo didn't close the door. It opened the door. Dr. Townsend was born in Nocona, Texas, which is a town steeped in the history of cowboy boots in America. It's too much to get into on this episode, but the backgrounds of Justin Boots, Nocona Boots, and Olsen Stelzer Boots are all connected to that part of Texas. Dr. Townsend was kind enough to show me his stellar collection of vintage cowboy boots and asked him to talk about how he got started in the boot business. Of 
go back to Ruth Roach, the woman that I told you a story about her breast coming, didn't I? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, she'd become great friends with me and my, my wife and Mary. We spent many a night there. Oh, she was a great cook. And so she said, now, Bud, if you're going to be a famous rodeo announcer, you're going to have to quit shining shoes. That doesn't look good. Be a boot black. I said, well, I got to got to make some money some way. I don't know. Oh, I heard about the gentleman who was the sales manager for Olson, Stelzer, Boot, and Saturday in Henrietta. He died. So, boy, this was a double whammy. So I decided to go up there and ask them if they'd give me the job selling boots. Hell, I'd, I'd never had a job doing anything. You know, this was way above uh, of my grade level. And so I went up there, and they talked to me. And this old gentleman, John Firestone, had passed away. And when I walked through the office that day, and my story wouldn't be complete without this, I looked over, and there were about six people, five or six, in the office. And then as you go through that door, oh, it was a beautiful Western store up there. I looked over here, and there was a woman sitting over there, young lady, with a pencil over her ear. You know, bookkeepers did that. And I looked down and saw her feet. She'd taken her shoes off. She worked in this corner. I went up and looked around, and if you think things don't have a chain to them, you know, I applied for this job, and he, I think he, Mr. Olson, he did the hiring. Norman Olson became one of my very best friends. We discussed the job and my background, whatever. So in the meantime, this girl that didn't have any shoes on, she came up to get the cash box every day. She said, you know, they're having a dance out at uh, the hut. It was a little stone building that the kids of the town could have dances and weddings or whatever. She's there at the Aram Square dance. I had no, I'd never thought anything about dating her or anything at all. I said, well, I know how to square dance. She said, I'd like to learn. I said, well, let's go out there tonight. And, of course, I had called square dances at rodeos, you know, for the horseback riders. And I could I could really call a square dance. Look out, eight, what you're talking, eight hands up, all go walking. Grab your howl, pat her on the head, she don't like biscuits, feed her on cornbread, swing low, swing high, you know. And I could call those square dances. So we went out. And she was engaged to another fellow, a World War II veteran, a sailor. And they'd gone together all through high school. And so we stopped and parked and had a kiss goodnight. That was the downfall. There was something about that kiss and that girl. Her name was Mary Smith. We started going together. He, he could only come on weekends, and I was there during the week. Well, I grabbed at her because she wouldn't go with me on the weekend. He grabbed, grabbed at her because he couldn't go with her in the week. So uh, one day he came in. Name was Wayne Glasgow, fine fellow, and said he needed to see Mary. So Mary came out. We we sold, we had a monopoly on Levi's. We had them stacked the size of top of that lamp. So she kind of got in an aisle between Hornets and Levi's, and he stood out where I could see him. And so they talked a good little bit. I saw her reach her hand out and give him her ring. And here he came. 
Well, I ran and got behind another stack of Levi's. He was a pretty big guy. So out he went. <laughs> well, then in six months we were married. So what was funny about Olson Stelzer was what I went back second time. And Mr. Olson said, do you know uh, uh, Mrs. Salmon? She, Ruth Roach had married Dick Salmon. I said, oh, I know Ruth real well. Uh, she's a friend of our family and whatever. He said, she's sure a fine lady. She and her, they bought all their boots. They didn't get along with Nocona. They bought all, it's only 28 miles apart. And so I called Ruth and said, Ruth, Olson Stelzer may give me a job. Now quit shining shoes. I said, would you call him? She said, no. Dick and I'll drive up there. Well, the next time I went, the man said, when can you come to work? So isn't that a strange thing that that Ruth rode that bronc in 1936? I'd known her all, and now she got me uh, this job. Oh, I love the job. See, it was Western people, ranch people, right down my alley. And then... I got a chance to get more money at Nocona, and I went down and worked for Enid, um, Miss Justin, for a couple of years. Then I wanted to go to college. That's when I got my idea to go to college, and I moved back because it's only 20 miles from Olson Stelzer to Midwestern. But Enid was always good to me. A lot of people didn't like her. She never paid me what she promised me. She paid me more. The deal was that I could work for her and take off and go to a rodeo and come back. In other words, it was an, a job that fit the rodeo business. So after I went to my first rodeo, after going to work for Andy Justin, she called me in. She said, Bud, you haven't turned in your expense account. <laughs> well, we didn't make a deal for it. No, I turned in all that, <laughs> so I was making twice as much money. So, yes, I love the cowboy boot business, love the people, and enjoyed Enid, but my real friends were the Olsen boys. They were Norwegian, and I stayed with Olsen's until I went to Baylor. I'd have to say in conclusion that from the time I went to work for Olson Stelzer till today, my life has really been a pleasure to use a Bob Wills song. I've had such a great life, met so many wonderful people, and a wonderful wife. She, she was a saint. In fact, my son-in-law, who's Jewish, you know, Jews, they're not as prone to talk about saints and things like that as we Protestants or Catholics. And he told me, he said, Bud, Mary is the nearest thing to a saint that I ever saw. And he told me that many times. So that's the kind of woman she was. So I've, I've been awfully lucky to get that barefooted woman. We just had a wonderful life together. We were married 67 years till she died. And it's been five years since she died. And those five years seem like 500. <laughs> the others went by in a hurry, but the ones without her didn't. I've had a great life. Almost unbelievable. Almost unbelievable. And I must say that I'll be unfair if I don't tell you that a lot of the credit or all of it to my life has been my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Mary was a great Christian and won me to Christ and whatever. So there you are.
All right, folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Dr. Charles Bud Townsend for taking the time to visit with me. I'd like to thank my friend Vince Moss, who suggested that I interview Dr. Townsend and who also arranged the interview and was in the room for this conversation. I'd like to thank Hal Cannon for playing the Cowboy Crossroads theme music. You can find out more about Hal at halcannon.com. I'd like to thank my Trail Boss patron, Bob Kelly, for his support of this episode. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to help me keep it going, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cowboy crossroads. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash cowboy crossroads. You can also make a donation on my website, andyhedges.com. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads.